It's um, my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, uh, Tom Waltz, who's in the Department of Cell Biology at Harvard. Um, Tom uh, worked uh, initially uh, with Andres Engel and uh, Peter Agre and Yoshinari Fujiyoshi uh, on uh, aquaporins, and that's what he's going to talk about today. But one of the things I was struck by in looking through his his CV and his website was the breadth of structural material that he investigates from iron transport to spliceosomes to cell adhesion junctions, all of which had the theme of actual function. What are these doing and how does the structure accomplish it? Um, and he has, I think, most turned that uh, into reality with aquaporin zero uh, with an amazing 1.9 EM crystal structure uh, that shows how this molecule can distinguish water and uh, allow water through, in an ordered, through the membrane in an ordered process. So Tom, the floor is yours. <coughs> So thank you very much for the very kind introduction. And I also would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and actually giving me the opportunity to present our work here. And so far, I really enjoyed this day and I'm very grateful to be here. And so what I would like to talk about today is the structure of the aquaporin zero mediated membrane junction. And you will see that we started with a very specific question. But now, towards the end of the project, we really gone into a completely different direction and a large part of my lab now works on using this as a model system to look at completely different questions. And so I thought I'd give you a very, very brief introduction into aquaporins. Aquaporin is a large family of membrane proteins that are subdivided into two classes. There are the pure aquaporins, these proteins down here, and these proteins only transport water, nothing else. No other small uh, neutral solutes, no ions, no proteins, nothing, pure water channels. In addition, there's a second group, these proteins up here, which are aquaglycerporins, and in addition to water, also transport small neutral solutes, such as gl uh, glycerol and urea. And aquaporins became quite famous when Peter Auger was awarded the Nobel Prize for discovering these proteins actually characterizing the function. And the field really quite exploded at that time. And pretty much every organism you look at, every cell you look at, they have an aquaporin somewhere. And um, all these proteins are, of course, very homologous. And also a few structures have been determined so far. And also the 3D structure is actually quite similar. But nevertheless, we were still interested in looking at another aquaporin, aquaporin zero here. And the reason we were interested in the structure of aquaporin zero was at the, at the time when we started to work on aquaporin zero, it was the only water channel which had a second function. It's not just a pure water channel. In addition, it also forms membrane junctions and therefore has a role in cell adhesion. And the question really was, what is different in aquaporin zero from all the other aquaporins that only this aquaporin can make these membrane junctions? And so aquaporin zero is found in the lens. It's a very specific aquaporin. Many aquaporins you can find in different tissues, and many, different uh, many tissues express different aquaporins. But aquaporin zero is very specific for the lens. It's only found in the lens, and in the lens it's only found in the fiber cells, and fiber cells only express aquaporin zero, so it's very specific. And so this is a thin section through the lens. This would be neighboring fiber cells, and you can see that large areas are really engaged in forming membrane junctions. And so there are these thick junctions here, and these thick junctions are formed by connexins, so these are actually gap junctions. But next to the gap junctions, you have these thin junctions here, and these thin junctions are formed by aquaporin zero. And if you now, instead of doing thin sectioning, if you do freeze fracture electromicroscopy, you can see that large areas of these junction membranes are occupied by these square arrays. And if you zoom in, you can actually very nicely see the lattice lines. And these are so well ordered that if you calculate a Fourier transform, you even get the fraction spots. 
So what this means is that these thin junctions between fiber cells in the lens are formed by square rays of occur point zero. And this is the structure that we wanted to look at. And so I give you a very brief introduction to the lens. The lens is a very simple tissue. It consists only of two different cell types. There is a single layer of epithelial, epithelial cells in the front of the lens. And at these two points, these epithelial cells start to differentiate in so-called fiber cells, which elongate and spend the entire width of the, of the lens. Now, this differentiation is actually quite remarkable. It's quite extreme because the fiber cells lose all their internal organelles. So in the end, you have a cell which is very similar to an erythrocyte. It's basically just a bag, a membrane bag filled with protein. And so this differentiation from epithelial cells into fiber cells not only occurs during embryogenesis when the lens is formed, but it continues all throughout the lifetime of an organism. And the older fiber cells don't get degraded, but they get pushed into the center of the lens and get accumulated in the core of the lens. So some of the oldest uh, cells that you have in your body are actually right in the middle of the lens. Now during this aging of the fiber cells, a lot of things is also happening to the membrane proteins. And so in the case of aqua point zero, what you get is an age-dependent cleavage of aqua point zero. So if you now purify the protein from the lens cortex where you have the young fiber cells, you get a single band of full length aquaporin zero. But you, if you isolate the protein from the core of the lens, you get a mixture of full length protein and cleaved aquaporin zero. And as the organisms age, you get more and more of the cleaved protein. So I should also mention that aquapoint zero is actually the most abundant membrane protein in fiber cells, and you can quite easily purify milligram amounts of the protein. Now, if you can purify milligram amounts of a membrane protein, what you want to do is to grow three-dimensional crystals. And because we want to do a structure, we like to work with a homogeneous uh, preparation of the protein, and so we initially worked with the aquapoint zero from the cortex. And so we tried to grow 3D crystals, and we were actually quite successful. Very early on, we got very nice, big 3D crystals of aquaporin zero. But to my embarrassment, I have to say that we actually never managed to put these crystals in, into an X-ray beam. So to this day, we actually don't know whether these crystals would refract or not. But anyway, we are not X-ray crystallographers. We are electromicroscopists. And we use a different technique to look at the structure of a membrane protein. And this is called electron crystallography of two-dimensional crystals. And the principle is that we start off with our membrane protein solubilized in a detergent solution, in detergent micelle. And then we simply add a few lipid molecules, really just a few lipid molecules, back into the system. And what we try to get are so-called mixed micelles, where we have the membrane protein surrounded by lipid molecules and the whole thing solubilized by a detergent micelle. And now we simply remove the detergent. We usually do it by dialysis. And what we obviously try to do is to reconstitute the protein into an artificial lipid bilayer. But because we use only very few lipid molecules, we get a very dense packing of the protein in the lipids. And on the favorable conditions, these proteins actually start to make crystallographic interactions. And because it's a membrane protein, the protein is only in the membrane. There's nothing outside of the membrane. So what we end up with is a single layer of crystallized protein. And that's what we call a two-dimensional crystal. And so we did this again with the full length of point zero that we isolated from the cortex. And maybe you can actually see that this is a membrane and there is a lattice in it. And so this is a two-dimensional crystal of aqua point zero in negative stain. To get higher resolution, we embedded these crystals in glucose and took images by cryo-electron microscopy. And when we calculated Fourier transforms, we got very nice diffraction out of resolution of about four angstroms. And so we took a lot of these images, combined them together, and calculated the projection map at four angstroms. And this is what the projection map looks like at four angstrom resolution. And basically, this is a nice accomplishment. But for us, it was actually very depressing, because when we compared this projection map of aqua point zero with the projection map of aqua point one, which is another water channel, you can see that each density in aqua point zero projection map is actually represented also in aqua point one. So each density you can really match up. Now, we know that aqua point one are single layer 2D crystals. 
which basically means that these crystals that we obtained here are also single layered. And that's really not what we wanted. We didn't want to just determine the structure of aqua point zero. What we wanted to look at is the membrane junction. And for quite a while, we only got the single layer 2D crystals. So we had to think what we can do to actually make these artificial membrane junctions to get double layer 2D crystals. And so what we knew so far is that aqua point zero in the lens cortex is full length protein. And when we use this protein to make 2D crystals, we end up with single layer 2D crystals. Now, of course, aqua point zero in the, core in the lens core is cleaved, partially cleaved. And what we found when we went into the literature was that membrane junctions are actually much more frequent in the lens core. So this suggested that it might actually be the cleavage of aqua point zero that induces the formation of membrane junctions. Unfortunately, this doesn't make all too much sense because the cleavage is cytoplasmic, while to make a membrane junction, you have to interact the exocell surfaces. So this was the idea we had, and so we thought we have to figure out whether this could actually be the case. And so what we did was to reconstitute aqua point zero and to do very small little vesicles, and all these vesicles actually contain 2D crystals of aqua point zero. And now we simply uh, incubated these crystals with chymotrypsin, and what you can see is that we can cleave about half of the protein. And after half an hour, no other thing, we just added chymotrypsin, and after half an hour we put the sample back into the microscope, and now we found that most of the vesicles really started to cluster, suggesting that it's really the cytoplasmic cleavage of the protein that enhances the adhesive property of aqua point zero. And so we are now pretty sure that this is the case. So now, instead of using this nice homogeneous aqua point zero, the full length aqua point zero from the cortex, we decided to work with aqua point zero from the core, where we have a fraction of cleaved protein. And when we did this, we came out with very, very nice 2D crystals. So this is a micrometer here, so you can see these are several micrometers in diameter. These are very big crystals. This is not even one of the biggest crystals. We have much, much bigger crystals than this. But the reason I like to show this image is if you look at the upper top edge here, you can actually see that you have two edges. And the reason for that is now that you have two membranes lying on top of each other, one membrane stopping here, one membrane stopping here. So already from this raw image, a negative stain, you know that you're looking at double layer 2D crystals. And again, we took images in uh, glucose by cryolector microscopy. We got very strong and very nice diffraction all the way out to four angstroms. We again calculated a projection map. And this is now the projection map of the double layered crystals at four angstrom. And if you compare this to our previous crystals, you can immediately see that they are different. And the main difference is really that you have these mirror axes which relate the, the right half and the left half of the protein to each other. And the only way that you can have a mirror axis in projection is if you have two tetramers sitting exactly on top of each other uh, and making top-to-top -top interactions. So from this now, we knew that we have double-layered 2D crystals resembling membrane junctions. So the typical way in electron microscopy or electron crystallography to get a, a structure out of 2D crystals is that you take images of untilted and tilted specimens and from these images, you extract the phase information. At the same time, you can collect electron diffraction patterns of untilted and tilted specimens, and from those, you extract the amplitude information. Then you combine amplitude and phases, you calculate a reverse Fourier transformation, and then you get a density map, and you build a model just like an X-ray crystallography. However, taking high-resolution images is much, 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 much harder than just collecting electron diffraction patterns. And so we thought we might try to make our life easier and use the same trick as X-ray crystallographers do all the time, namely just record electron diffraction patterns and then so, uh, solve the structure by molecular replacement. And so we started to collect electron diffraction patterns. This is an untilted crystal, and you can see very nice diffraction all the way to three angstroms. And then we also have to collect diffraction patterns from tilted specimens. And again, we got diffraction to about three angstroms. So we combined all these electron diffraction patterns and 
solve the structure or face the, the, the intensity data set using aqua point one as a search model for molecular replacement. And this worked wonderfully well, and so we got a three angstrom density map and were able to make an atomic model of this aqua point zero mediated membrane junction. And so in blue is the aqua point zero tetramer in one membrane, which would be up here, and aqua point zero tetramer in the lower membrane down here. And they come together and form these very nice interactions in the middle. And so now we could actually answer the question, what is different in aquapoint zero from all the other aquapoints that aquapoint zero can make these membrane junctions? And so one difference is very easy. It's not glycosylated, so you don't have to worry about sugar when you bring two tetramers together. In addition, loop A of aquapoint zero is much shorter than in most other aquapoints, and this allows the two tetramers to approach each other and make these interactions. And most of these interactions are actually mediated by proline residues, which are conserved, highly conserved in aquapoint zero species from, uh, aquapoint zeros from different species, but much less conserved in other aquapoints. And so the interactions are quite interesting. There is a nice interaction right in the middle here. And so it's a single proline residue, proline 38. And proline 38 from all four subunits in this tetramer come together to form this nice little proline ring. And the same happens with the lower tetramer. Again, you get this proline ring. And these two make stacking interactions so that in, in this interaction, actually each subunit of the, of the pair of tetramers is connected to all the other subunits in the, in the junction. Now, in addition to the central interaction, there are also these peripheral interactions. This is mediated by loop A. These peripheral interactions are mediated by loop C. And again, it's proline residues, so there is a proline-proline motif in loop C, and the proline-proline motif in this subunit diagonally interacts with the proline-proline motif in this subunit down here. So you have this diagonal interaction. And if you move a little bit along loop C, you get to this arginine residue, which yet again interacts with the proline residue, this time in the subunit down here. So in this way, each subunit in one tetramer is connected to two subunits in the tetramer and the opposing membrane. So this was really the question that we started out with trying to answer what is, how, how does aquapoint zero make these junctions? But then we realized what is actually happening when you bring a water channel in contact with another water channel? Do you actually make a cell-to-cell -cell water channel? Very similar to gap junctions, where you have a connexin hemi channel in one membrane, another connexin hemi channel in the second membrane, you bring them together and you make a cell to cell communication channel. It's the same sort of thing happening here with aquapoint zero and the water channel. So, to look at this, we first looked at aquapoint one, which is a very efficient water channel. And if you look from the top, you can see the six transmembrane alpha helices here. These are the pore lining residues. And very obvious, you can see the water channel in the middle of the subunit. Now, to our surprise, it looked quite different when we looked at our junction aqua point zero, because we could see the transmembrane alpha helices, we could see the pore lining residues, but the water channel was kind of gone. And so we really didn't expect that. And so based on this observation, we proposed that aqua point zero in the junction no longer functions as a water channel it completely switches its function from having a full-length protein being a completely functional water channel. You cleave the, 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 the termini, you form a membrane junction, and you stop being a water channel. You're just simply a cell adhesion molecule. And this might sound a little bit outlandish to you, but it's not so unusual in the lens. Because remember, these fiber cells lose all their internal organelles, so they can no longer produce any protein. And so at the same time, it's a very long-lived cell. So what the lens often does, it uses the same protein for different purposes. And the famous example are crystallins, which are highly expressed in the lens, and they're used to create a refractive index to actually focus the light onto the retina. But crystallins are actually nothing else but glycolytic enzymes and heteroproteins. So the lens uses the same proteins for completely different purposes, and this is known as the principle of gene sharing. And so we think that aquapoint zero is another example of gene sharing, where the lens uses the same protein first as a water channel and later on to form cell adhesion. 
Now, this was our idea based on a three angstrom structure. But if you really want to make the point that this is a closed water channel, you would really like to see water molecules, because then in the open channel you would expect to see water molecules, in the closed channel there shouldn't be water molecules. But if you want to see water molecules, you need a resolution of about two and a half angstroms or better. And this is a resolution that is not easily or ever has been obtained by electron crystallography. But on the other hand, we had these really, really beautiful crystals, and we thought if we use a better microscope, we might be able to push the resolution a little bit further. And so we packed these crystals up and went to Japan to use the microscope developed by Yoshinori Fujiyoshi, who has a microscope that you can cool down to liquid helium, so you reduce the beam damage and you can use more electrons to take an image, so you get a cleaner image. At the same time, it has a top entry stage, so it's extremely stable, and you can get just extremely good data out of this. So for us, using this microscope is like for X-ray crystallography for going to a synchrotron. And so with this microscope and our 2D crystals, we got very beautiful electron diffraction patterns. This is a typical one. So three angstrom, this is the data that we initially included in our first model. Two and a half angstrom was the highest uh, data set obtained by electron crystallography. This is a bacterial dopsin data set collected in Fujiyoshi's laboratory, but it hasn't been published yet. And in our case, we constantly got a complete coverage of diffraction all the way out to two angstroms. And very often, we could actually see diffraction spots all the way out to 1.5 angstroms. And so again, we collected a lot of these electron diffraction patterns of untilted and tilted specimens. We combined them to a resolution of 1.7 angstroms, and then we find the structure to 1.9 angstroms. And so this is part of the density map at 1.9 angstroms. And you can see that this is a vanilla and then you have an aromatic ring and you can nicely see the hole in the middle of the ring. This is a tyrosine, again, you see nicely the hole in the middle of the aromatic ring, but there's some extra density because of the hydroxyl group, which you're missing obviously in the vanilla and then. So now you have really an amazing structural detail. And at this resolution of 1.9 angstrom, it's actually also quite easy to see the water molecules. And so now this is one molecule so this would be the cytoplasmic side, this is the exocellular side, and on top here would be the second molecule that would make the membrane junction. And so this is the water pathway all the way through the protein, and if you look at it, there are only these three densities here which would be consistent with water molecules. Now, if you calculate the pore profile, you can see that only in this area where we actually observe the water molecules, the pore is wide enough to accommodate water, while above and below, the channel is actually too narrow to accommodate water molecules. Now, I should mention that in open water channels, all the crystal structures, you can actually see seven to nine water molecules all the way through the, through the water channel, and they're all hydrogen bonded. Now, in our case, we only have three water molecules, and they are far, too far apart from each other to form hydrogen bonds. So to us, this is a very good indication that in the junction, there's really not much water transport going on anymore. It's pretty much a closed channel. So this is the ribbon diagram. And so these are the three water molecules at the center of the channel. Then you have these big gaps in, in the cytoplasmic and the exocellular side until you get to the water, which is close to the bulk water outside of the channel. And now, very fortunately, Bob Stroud at UCSF was actually able to crystallize the full-length protein, the full-length aquaporin zero. And so what we would have predicted is that the full-length protein would not make a junction and it would be in the open conformation. And that's exactly what the X-ray crystal, uh, structure showed. The tetramers in the crystals were individual, they were not paired. In addition, they found this continuous line of water molecules all the way through the water pool. And now we are in this very fortunate situation that we can compare the full length structure, the full length protein, which doesn't form a junction and is in the open conformation, with the junctional protein, which is formed by the cleave protein, which is in the closed conformation. Now we can start to answer questions. So the first question is, of course, how is it that when you cleave the cytoplasmic site, that you actually end up with a membrane junction? And so this is the X-ray structure of the full length protein. 
And you can see there's an aromatic residue at the end terminus, and this aromatic residue talks nicely into a hydrophobic pocket formed by these residues of the transmembrane alpha helices. And also the C terminus makes, or the beginning of the C terminus makes nice interactions with amino acids um, contributed by the transmembrane alpha helices. In addition, there's a cross bridge between the N terminus and the C terminus. So these tails, these termini, are really held closely in position. Now, as the fiber cells age, there's a lot of cleavage at the N and the C terminus, and the major cleavage sites are shown here at the C terminus and the N terminus. Now, if you cleave it, what you basically do is you break all these interaction networks, and you basically liberate both the N and the C terminus. And through a mechanism that we unfortunately don't understand, this liberation of the N and the C terminus leads to conformation change of loop A from this conformation to this conformation. And this is a very important and crucial conformation change. So this is the exocell surface of the full length non-junctional protein. And so there are three important residues, this proline, arginine, and tryptophan residue. The proline is actually the proline that in the junction makes this nice little ring, but in the full length protein, in the non junctional protein, this proline is actually removed from the center. In addition, you have an arginine here, which is talked nicely at the interface in between these two subunits, so it's nicely talked away. But then you have this tryptophan residue, and this tryptophan residue is really sticking out of the surface of the tetramer, and by doing so, prevents the approach of a second tetra to make a junction. Now, if you cleave the C termini, the N and the C terminus on the cytoplasmic side, what happens is that this loop A from this side of these two alpha helices moves to the other side of the two alpha helices, which is shown here. And what this results in is that the proline now moves into the center and forms this nice little ring that you need to make the junction. The tryptophan and the arginine simply switch their positions so the arginine, which was in between the subunits, now moves over the entrance of the water pore and actually helps to close the water pore. But the tryptophan, which was sticking out, is now moving in between the two subunits and no longer interferes with the approach of the second tetramer. And so in this conformation, you now can bring a second tetramer, put it on top of it, and now all three subunits, all, th all three residues actually engage in interactions that stabilize the membrane junction. So the proline I talked before, the tryptophan makes stacking interactions, and the two arginines interact with each other through a water molecule. So this is how you form the membrane junction by cutting the termini on the cytoplasmic side. The next question is, why does the formation of a membrane junction actually close the, the, the water pore? And so when we compared the X-ray structure of the full-length protein with the EM structure, uh, of, the, of the junction of the cleave protein, we found that there's actually only one residue, this methionine in here, which is a markedly different conformation in the open and the closed channel. And you can see this very nicely in the density map. So this is the methionine, this is the water pore, and you can see it is nicely on the side of the water pore, and so you have these two water molecules that can be in the water pore. While in the, in the junction, this methionine now moves right into the center of the water pore, displaces these two water molecules, and creates this big gap between the central water and the XSL water. Now, this methionine, which is responsible for the closure of ocoporin zero, is only conserved in ocoporin zero from different species, but not in other ocoporins. So this closing mechanism is very specific for ocoporin zero. So now the whole thing became very interesting to us from this point on, and what really sparked our interest is shown here. So if you make a two-dimensional crystal, usually what holds these crystals together are direct protein-protein interactions. But if you look at the packing of these tetramers, there are no protein-protein interactions. So what is actually holding this 2D crystal together? And so we decided to look in between the tetramers. We no longer look at the protein now, we just look at this area in between the tetramers. Instead of looking from the top, we're now going to look from the side. And if we look at the density map just in between the tetramers, what we found were these four layers of elongated densities here. 
And what these are, of course, are the lipid molecules. And so what we, were, what we were able to do is actually to model a real lipid bilayer. So this is the lipid bilayer as it exists in between the tetramers of aquapoint zero. And so this is really the first structural model of a, of a lipid bilayer that is based on experimental data. And so what is holding the crystals together are not protein-protein interactions, but protein-lipid-protein interactions. And what you can see is that most of these lipids are actually sandwiched in between two tetramers, aquapoint zero tetramers, and so they are very restricted in their mobility, and that's probably the reason why we could actually see these lipids. And so for each subunit, aquapoint zero subunit, we could find or we could model nine lipid molecules. Seven of these lipid molecules are in direct contact with the protein and therefore represent annual lipids. In addition, we have lipids eight and nine, which are not in direct contact with the protein. They're just contacting other lipids, and so they represent bulk lipids. And since we now have the protein and the lipid, we can actually look at protein-lipid interactions. And what we found were three layers of interactions. So the first layer of interaction is between the acyl chains here and residues of the hydrophobic belt of the membrane protein. And so that's really not very surprising. However, what was surprising to us was that not all the lipids were in these nice elongated uh, conf uh, conformations. This lipid, for example, has the acyl chains really splayed apart. And what happens is that this acyl chain actually weaves its way through this little cluster of three aromatic residues while the other acyl chain interacts intimately with this cluster of isoleucins, five isoleucins. So there are much more intricate interactions between the lipid molecules and the, and the protein than I would have thought would, have, would occur. So the second layer of interaction is formed between these aromatic residues. And for a long time, it has been known that in between the hydrophilic part of a membrane protein and the hydrophobic part, there's very often a ring of aromatic residues which delineates the hydrophilic from the hydrophobic part. And what we found was that these aromatic residues very often interacted with the glycerol of the lipid molecule. And again, this also makes sense because the glycerol, again, is the interface between the hydrophilic head group of the, pro of the lipid and the hydrophobic acyl chains of the lipid. Now, the third layer of interaction we found between the um, phosphatidylcholine head group of the lipids and positively charged side chains of the membrane protein. And these interactions are typically mediated by water molecules. So I should mention that this is not the first time that people have seen lipids bound to membrane proteins. There are crystal structures where lipids have also been crystallized and you can see the interaction. But these lipids come all the way from the donor membrane they co-purified with the membrane protein so that they finally got crystallized and you could actually see them. So these are very tightly and very specifically bound lipids. Now this is very different because aquapoint zero that we use for this was completely delipidated. In addition, the lipids that we use for the 2D crystals are DMPC molecules, which are synthetic lipids. They don't exist in vivo. So basically what we look at here are non-specific lipid protein interactions. And this is basically how any membrane protein sits in a lipid bilayer. And what was a bit surprising to me is that the difference between the specific and non-specific interactions are actually quite minimal. They seem to be very similar. So this is what we have done so far. And now at the end, I just wanted to give you a very brief overview of the kind of experiments that we now want to do. And so this is really the basis, the lipid-protein interactions. And the next thing we want to do is to look at lipid dynamics. Because to get to model these lipids, we only had enough data to model the most predominant conformation of the lipid. However, in the initial density map, we could see that very often the, the densities for the acyl chains were branched, clearly indicating that there are many different conformations of the lipid. And so by including more data, we now want to model all the different conformations of the lipid, and by doing so, trying to get an idea about the dynamics of the lipid in between these aquapoint zero tetramers. But we are only in the process of doing this. Then the second thing is, we wanted to look at the effects of lipids on the protein structure. 
And there we actually already did some, some analysis, and I, I don't really want to go into detail here. But the, the nice thing was that we have an EM structure of the protein in a lipid bilayer, where there's also an X-ray structure of the protein embedded in a detergent micelle. And so we could actually look at the interaction of the lipids on the residues that they contact as compared to the same residues when they contact detergent molecules. And um, I'm not going to talk about this, but basically what we found was that the lipids actually stabilize the residues that they, that they contact. And even crystallographically bound detergent molecules don't have this effect. They do not stabilize the residues that they contact. But um, what is really now interesting is we want to look at lipid protein interactions in a much more systematic way. And so first of all, we wanted to look at lipid binding motifs. And so this is based on a very nice analysis done by Carl Hunter, who looked at all the different lipids found in crystal structures and deduced a lipid binding motif. And so we wanted to see whether our non-specifically interacting lipids also interact through these binding motifs. And what we found is that they do not. We don't see specific lipid binding motifs. Now the problem, unfortunately, at this point is that Coyle Hunter's lipid binding motif uh, applies to every lipid except phosphatidylcholine lipids because phosphatidylcholine is a big head group and doesn't seem to accommodate this binding motif. So the fact that we don't see this specific lipid binding motif at this point, we don't know whether it's because we use phosphatidylcholine uh, as a lipid or because we have non-specific lipid protein interactions. So what we have to do now is to look at crystals grown with different lipids. And there's a lot of things that we can do if we manage to do that. We can, for example, change the head groups and see how the interactions between the head groups and the proteins change. We can also use uh, uh, lipids with different length of acyl chains. So if you have long longer acyl chains, what happens? Do you actually push the lipid bilayer further out? Do you get interactions at a different level? Or do you get more of an overlap between the two lipid bilayers, the monolayers and the bilayer? So there's an, a lot of stuff we can now look at. And this is really what we are very excited about doing now. And so far, we got 2D crystals with E. coli polar lipids. And these are completely different lipids. So they don't have phosphatidylcholine head groups. They have phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylglycerol, and then there's 10% cardiolipin. And with this, with this lipid mixture, we also got very nice 2D crystals. And actually, in our microscope in Boston, these crystals even diffract better than the phosphatidylcholine crystals. So in addition to having different head groups, there are also the length of the acyl chain, in average, is longer in, in E. coli lipids. So when we get the final data set here, we really hope to see what happens to the lipid bilayer when you have longer acyl chains. And actually, as of last week, we now also have 2D crystals with phosphatidylethanolamine, phosphatidylglycerol, and phosphatidylserine, which all diffract like this. So now we're really in a very good position that we can look very specifically at different head group protein interactions. But it will take us a while to actually get to all these structures. And so with this, I wanted to end and acknowledge the people who actually did the work. So almost all the work up to the 1.9 angstrom structure was done by Tommy Gonan, a very good postdoc who now has his own group at the University of Washington in Seattle. He got a lot of help from Yifan Cheng, who was our EM manager. He now also has his own group at UCSF. And the new work with the different lipids and analysis of lipid protein interaction, this is being done by Richard Hyde, who is an extremely gifted um, student in my lab, who fortunately will stay for a little longer to finish this project. And then, as an electron microscopist, we usually don't get to these very high resolutions. So Piotr Sliss and especially Steve Harrison did a fantastic job helping us to get through the refinement of this really high resolution structure. Jörg Kistler at the University of Auckland, he sent us all the lenses that we needed to purify the protein. And then Yoko Hiroki and especially Yoshino Fujiyoshi, we are very grateful to not only for giving us access to this wonderful microscope, but Yoshi really coached us very, very well in getting all this really high resolution data out of these 2D crystals. 
So these are the people who did all the work, and they really deserve all the credit. And thank you very much for your attention. Time for a few questions. John? Yes. Uh, in, talk, okay. uh, in the structure of your uh, closed pour, mm -hmm. uh, you had two arginines kissing a water bottle. What provides the electrical neutrality in that locale, and how is that changed when you put this in the middle of the Are there some other ones? Where is this? Two arginines kissing each other? Two arginines. When the door closed, you had two arginines coming very close in proximity. Oh, <laughs> but this was the interaction between the two. So this is mediated by by water molecule. And there's also a buffer in there, so there are ions which neutralize the, the field and so on. So it's probably shielded also by, by counter ions in the buffer. Do you imagine that that's a site where the lipid <coughs> uh, negative charge would interact? Um, not exactly, because the negative charge comes from the phosphate group, which is actually quite distant from there. And the phosphatidyl coal and head groups are actually also positively charged, so there might be more neutralizing by ions in the buffer. So Tom, first of all, uh, congratulations on your appointment to our Hughes uh, Medical Institute. <laughs> so that's really a wonderful work. Uh, and it's not a <laughs> but also open up uh, so many things you can study with the lipid protein interaction. So I have a very quick two questions. One is the methionine, which blocks the water channel. Yeah. Can you mutate and restore the function? Um, very good question, and these kind of experiments we would absolutely love to do. We would also like to mutate the pro prolines that, that make the interaction. The problem we have is that we isolated it from natural sources, so we can't really mutate anything. We would have to clone the protein and, also, and all of these things, which is not a problem which we could do, but quite honestly, I expected other people to do this. <laughs> And it hasn't happened yet, so we might actually start doing these kind of experiments. That's exactly the kind of experiments we would love to do. Is this or is it it's mouse? No, we actually get the material from New Zealand. That's the reason it's cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so can, can you also comment in kind of general, uh, if you look on the structure of all of the aquaporins now today, how much do they differ in topology, not in a specific residues? Obviously, like in this case, you have this methionine blocking. But in general topology, why, why do we need that many of those proteins? Is it regulation, or is it the rate of water transmission? That's an excellent question. And so one of the arguments is always you can knock out an aquaporin and not much is happening. And that's kind of. When you have a really important protein, you want to have redundancy, so when one goes wrong, that you get others to, to jump in. That's a very good question. And um, all of the aquaporins have slightly different permeability characteristics, which are really optimized for the tissue where they're expressed in. So we're now actually working on aquaporin 9, which is another one, which is completely different in that it not only allows water and small neutrosolutes, but actually quite big neutral solids to go through, and also arsenide, for example. And so aquaporin 9 is really well um, optimized to function in the metabolism of the liver. So I think there's also some of them need to be regulated. Some of the, of the tissues need to have different water permeabilities at different times. So I think there's really a lot of optimization going on, but the, the basic structure of all of them is almost identical. There's some differences um, between the XSL side of, of glycerol facilitators and water channels, and also in the pore, of course. But as a general, they look very, very similar. So there's a lot more research needed to really figure out what, what the differences are for all these different ones and why they are needed. What do you see in the fourfold axis of symmetry <laughs> the paired versus the unpaired tetramers? That's another very good question. So the, the, the question is, what, what's in the middle of the tetramer? Because there's actually a big opening. And <clears throat> we see some density in there. And we don't know what it is. 
we, we see some density in there, but it's not well enough defined that we could actually figure out what it is because it's in a completely hydrophobic environment. So the, 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 the central channel in aquaponics is actually the big remaining mystery. Nobody really knows what it is. And so there were suggestions that this might actually be an ion channel, um, which may or may not be. Um, I doubt it. Um, <coughs> there's also was an idea that it could be the gas channel, the gas could go through the center. But if you in inhibit the water transport by mercury, you also inhibit the gas transport, suggesting that it also goes through the channels and the monomers, not to, through the central channel and the tetramer. So at this point, it's really still not known what the central channel actually does. We did those experiments in, in, yeah. The mercury, it turns out, with better resolution, blocks about half of the gas permeability of CO2, at least, and the other half looks like it's going through the central pore. So I was curious what oh. the central pore might look like in aquaporin zero. Um, it looks pretty much the same as in all other aquaporins, but because it's the four foot symmetry, in our case, it's even, we have P422 symmetry. So there is a lot of averaging going on in this central axis. And therefore, I really don't want to speculate on any of the things that we see in that, that particular region. One last question, Mark. Uh, Tom, uh, the structure, function, and dynamics of lipid bilayers has been studied for a number of years. How do you think that, uh, how do you think that stacks up against high resolution experimental data like we've seen it here? Yeah, so it's actually what we are studying is not a pure membrane a lipid protein interaction because the lipids normally just lipids interact with one membrane protein. In this case, we actually interact with two membrane proteins. So it's not, not pure the way we would love to do it. But um, I think we can actually look at all the theory that has been built up and see whether the reality actually stacks up and we might be able to refine the theory and how proteins modulate lipids and lipid modulates protein. One of the things I'm interested in is that there is a theory that, that helicoproteins, depending on the thickness of the bilayer, can actually extend and shrink. And for me, it's a bit hard to imagine that this happens. But this is now a really <coughs> easy way to actually check whether this theory is correct or not. And I think this translates to a lot of other of these interactions that have been postulated and, and thought about. So it is going to be back and forth between theory and, and practice. <coughs>